Councilwoman Yvette Clark is a Brooklyn native, proud of her Jamaican heritage. She attended New York City public schools, graduated from Oberlin College, and was a recipient of the prestigious APPAM Sloan Fellowship in Public Policy and Public Analysis. Prior to being elected to the House of Representatives, Congresswoman Clark served on the New York City Council representing the 40th District in Brooklyn. She succeeded her, pioneer mother, her pioneering mother, former city council member, Dr. Una S. T. Clark, making them the very first mother-daughter secession in the history of the city council. <laughs> Absolutely. It runs in her DNA. The leadership, the advocacy, it's an amazing thing. And so she's also an activist, a community organizer, and now a legislator. In the 116th Congress, Congresswoman Yvette Clark serves on the Energy and Commerce Committee and the Committee on Homeland Security. She was elected as Vice Chair of the Full Energy and Commerce Committee on January 15, 2019. She is also the co-chair of the Black Women and Girls Caucus, which develops programs to support the aspirations of black women of all ages. She's also the chair of the Congressional Black Caucus Immigration Task Force. Lastly, Congresswoman Clark serves as co-chair of the Caribbean Caucus, where she has uh, worked to build a relationship between the United States and the Caribbean community as it relates to trade, immigration reform, direct investment through development programs, and much more. Will you all please rise to your feet, please, and give me a welcome for Congresswoman Yvette Clark. Let me uh, thank Crystal for emceeing uh, this afternoon's panel and uh, for her sisterhood. I truly, truly appreciate your work and um, all that you have done to uh, represent. Uh, good, hello and good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. It's certainly my honor and my privilege to present to you today this creative series. As has been stated, I am uh, Yvette D. Clark, and I represent New York's 9th Congressional District in Brooklyn, New York. As vice chair of the House Energy and Commerce Committee, and a proud member of the Distinguished Congressional Black Caucus, it is a pleasure to be here with you all at the 49th Annual Legislative Conference and specifically at today's Creative Series Panel discussion. I also serve as co-chair along with my colleagues, Congressman Tony Cardenas and Congresswoman Judy Chu of the Multicultural Media Caucus. We are dedicated to issues related to the state of diversity and inclusion in the media industry. A core theme for us, promoting multicultural media and multi-interest participation. And that's why I'm hosting today's panel discussion, to bring together experts from the creative industry to talk about what it means to be a black creative in 2019. My primary goal has been to ensure diverse voices are being represented on and off screen, including journalists, correspondents, directors, producers, programmers, distributors, executives, behind the camera and on the air personalities, plus all other creatives. Most importantly, and more and just as significant, that we directly benefit from our creative endeavors. So today, more than ever, we should keep in the forefront of our minds this year's annual legislative conference theme. We must promote our legacy. And remember that our possibilities are seen and heard and felt by the entire world. I have and will continue to fight for justice, fairness, and equity in a myriad of industries where our talent, our skill, and our expertise has been exploited, de devalued, and outright appropriated. It is critical that we continue to fight and attain ownership of our own intellectual property rights. And that is my passion, that is my mission. 
you can join in too. Join by being engaged, by being outspoken, by being present as we continue to battle for justice. That means making sure your voices are heard. That means demanding the seats at the table to be inclusive and representative of our lived experience and the real value in its authenticity. By joining in this fight, you too will become a champion for change. You too will help the creative industry become an inclusive uh, and a true reflection of black faces. Our stories are shared through common experiences and it's exciting and encouraging to witness how our creative industry is becoming more representative of us with each passing year. Remember Oscar So White? We trended that so heavy the next year, I don't know, I think, you know, we got more awards than we'd ever gotten before. So what we mean, but we have to sustain that. You can't be uh, out there hashtagging one year, let it slide, because you know what happens. Muscle memory, everything snaps back to the way it was uh, previously. So I want to thank our panelists today, the new faces and voices of the entertainment industry and the current work being done to take creative control in the narrative of the black experience. I'm truly humbled and honored to have each of you here today. And I want to thank you. Thank you. And from here, I'm going to hand it over to Crystal, who will start us off with our first panel, Young Creatives, Industry, and Influencers, followed by our second panel, and its owns David Makes Men. Uh, before I, I actually hand it over, hand it over, I, I have to acknowledge that my mama is in the room. Mother Clark. We, all right, enjoy everyone, and thank you for coming. Awesome. Can we have a quick show of hands? How many creatives? I love to see who's a creative in the audience. Oh, wonderful. What types? Any screenwriters? Okay. Actors? All right. On air talent? Okay. Awesome. Anyone I didn't mention? Any creatives I didn't mention that need to? Producers. Absolutely. Photographers. Content creators. Awesome, awesome. This is gonna be a well-rounded discussion. I would love to bring up our moderator. Um, her name is also Crystal. Crystal High Taylor is a social entrepreneur and communications and policy strategist with a decade's worth of experience working with local, state, government, national civil rights, civic and business associations, as well as think tanks, public relations firms, and Fortune 500 brands. As a licensed attorney and creative professional, Crystal specializes in multimedia production, organizational development, change management, digital advocacy, and online coalition builder as coalition building as well as stakeholder engagement. So thank you so much, Crystal, <laughs> for being today's moderator. Please do um, come up and I guess introduce your panel. Thank you. First of all, thank y'all so much for coming. We know there are a lot of events going on, so appreciate your time, your attention, your energy. I actually would like all of my marvelous panelists um, to come and join me on the stage. We have Reggie Lockhart, Christina Faith, and Panama Jackson. Let us give them a round of applause as they come. I am not going to introduce them because they're gonna tell you who they are, which is exciting. Um, so I love this temperature check of all the creatives in the room. So this is gonna be a very interactive conversation. So once you get to know a little bit about who's up here, I have questions, but we really wanna know your questions, right? That's why you're here. And I know this row right here, y'all raise your hand every single time. So I know we're gonna get some stuff um, from y'all. So I wanna get this thing rolling really quickly. Each of y'all have two minutes. We're gonna keep it at two minutes. I have my clock here. I know, look, I have the timer, but really just to get things started, 
tell us a bit about yourself, what inspired you to create space for your voice in today's media and entertainment landscape. And Reggie, we will start with you. Did I just put this on? I hope so. Okay, now I, I project. Um, so it's on, here, just pull it closer okay. to you. So my name is Reggie Lochard. Uh, I'm from Brooklyn, New York. And thank you. <laughs> yes, come on, Brooklyn. Deep in here. Um, and I'm a producer, I'm a writer, and I'm also an actor. I started off in the business as an actor, um, and this panel is so important to me because this panel is the reason why I became a producer and a writer. So I started off as an actor. I've been in the business for a little bit 10 years now. I mean, I might not look it, but believe it, I've been in this, this business for a while. And as an actor, my first manager would always send me on auditions and roles that I really didn't feel like, you know, I enjoyed. I, I knew that I had more to offer, and every time I, I would speak to her, she would say, well, you know, like, let's just keep going on these auditions. Let's just keep booking these auditions. And really, the incentive was for her, you know, to keep getting a check, which is great, but my incentive is to tell our story. And um, I went to North Carolina Central University for undergrad, and uh, I have two degrees, um, and one of my degrees is in English literature. So writing has always been something I'm very good at. And ever since I, and ever since I was a child, I've had a very, um, as my mom would say, imaginative uh, you know, uh, thought process. So um, yeah, so, so after you know, a couple of years of acting and not really getting my footing where I wanted to be, I said, you know what, let me go to NYU. I applied and I got into a screenwriting program and I kind of took my skill set you know, of writing to make my own projects. I created my first short film uh, back in 2013, and uh, it did pretty well for me. It went to a couple festivals, and that was a project that really set me up to kind of um, say to myself, I can do this. You know, I can really do this. I have, I have this skill set, and then from there, how much time? You have about 20 seconds. All right, <laughs> sorry about that. <laughs> I'm gonna roll through this, so then, um, from there, I kind of just started producing projects and writing projects. At this point in my juncture, I've written about uh, six or seven scripts. And uh, last year, 2018, for all you writers in here, you, you young writers, there's a platform called The Blacklist. Um, my script made the final, um, and it kind of propelled my career. So this past year has really been um, a whirlwind for me, and I'm still in it. So, um, and my feature, my first feature last year, um, got into several film festivals. So um, that's my spiel. I'll continue to talk about myself in a bit. I just don't want to go over time. Perfect, thank you. Christina? Miss Vaughn, I can forget. Okay, how you guys doing? Uh, mm -hmm. I thank you. Um, pull it, pull it, just pull it to you. Mm -hmm. that's, that, that's gonna kinda like, um, all right, I'm sorry. So my name is Christina Faith. I'm a writer, producer, and director. Um, I went to 13 different schools by the time I was in ninth grade. Uh, I come from a, I know, right, it's crazy. I come from a mother who was a functional addict and a father who died of an OD when, he, when I was nine years old. My mother was extremely educated and wanted me to be educated in the midst of that. She just got caught up in the crack era. So every time we moved, it generally was because she either lost her job because um, it was also the, uh, the boom, um, or it was also because the school that I was in wasn't great. Um, ended up going to Rutgers for my undergrad degree. I swore I was going to be an entertainment lawyer. Um, I got a degree in, Afri well, my major was um, criminal justice and Africana studies, and I minored in English and criminology because I swore I was going to be an entertainment lawyer. I got a job right out of college uh, to go to law school and get, well, they paid for me to go to law school. I got a job at Rutgers, um, took the LSATs, and then I heard the Lord say seminary. I wasn't raised in the church at all. <laughs> um, I was a heathen. Um, and so I really, I went through a very big transition and change in my life where I went from not being a believer to being a very strong believer. Mm -hmm. um, and in the midst of that, I ended up at seminary. At seminary, I thought I was going because I thought I wanted to preach and God was using that to show me that I was called to media. Um, all of my professors were kind of like, so it seems like you have a really huge desire for culture. Um, while in seminary, I picked up my first camera. Now, for, the, for those years as well, I had been an artist. I was a rapper, and I had a music label. I had about 13 people under me. Um, we had music videos that ended up going viral. Um, and in the midst of that, I ended up doing services. And then I did services for other uh, companies and nonprofits for years, like for 10 years. I'm 36. And so um, when I turned 30, 
33, um, I kind of decided, 32, 33, I no longer wanted to do services like that. I didn't want to make a living off of providing other people's um, creativity and giving it life when I hadn't given my, given my own life. Um, I wrote my first script. It was my uh, based off of a book that I was writing. Um, I had done plays before. I had done like little shorts. Um, the first time it was absolutely terrible. Um, but I had people who just were willing to help. And so I created a series called Single and Anxious. Um, I had wrote a book called Single and Anxious. They are completely bipolar to one another. Um, <laughs> the series is about um, college students who are in, they call it in Love Triangle of Love, Lies, and Crime. And then it just did really well. Got a lot of film festival recognition. We did three seasons. They're all on Amazon. And then last year, I went to a, um, me and uh, Reggie are a, a motion picture um, association ambassadors. And we went to American um, Black Film Festival, which is the largest black film festival. So it's my third year. Um, John Gibson, who always just opens doors for us, um, ended up in a room with Netflix. And they're like, where's your first feature? And I was like, I don't have it. But I was like, oh, God, can I get my first feature? Um, so I went back to my hotel room that night, and I said, Lord, can you give me a feature? And so over the last three months, well, from that point until literally now, uh, we wrote a feature. It was done in March, um, the writing. And then we started filming in June. I was able to cast uh, Mark Hood, who's from The Voice, as the lead. And then I got a whole bunch of people to say okay, and we did it with no money. And so my first feature will be done as of, well, it's turned into Sundance on Monday. Um, and so it's just been a very long uh journey to figuring out exactly how to do what I do. So I tell people um, I got my master's um, at Google University and my um, <laughs> undergrad at YouTube.com. That's awesome. <laughs> Thank you. My name is Panama Jackson. I'm one of the co-founders of VerySmartBrothers.com. Um, living embodiment of why not. I fell in love with writing the way most of us in my generation did, trying to write poetry to get women. Uh, turns out I was very bad at that, but <laughs> um, at the same time, I fell in love with writing. Now, at the same time, my degrees are in economics, mathematics, and I have a master's in public policy. I actually worked on Capitol Hill for 14 years the entire time I was doing VSB. Um, I used to joke that if I ever got fired, I wouldn't complain because even if they didn't fire me for the right reason, they had a reason, <laughs> because I was absolutely <laughs> using government resources to uh, run a website. Um, VSB is a space for blackness, where blackness lives. We talk about pop culture, general blackness, black blackness, anything that has to do with what we're, what's going on in our community. And we started VSB pretty much on a whim. Damon Young and I, who just, Damon just dropped his first book, What Doesn't Kill You Makes You Black, and we literally came up with the idea for VSB in like five minutes. We were talking, we're like, hey, we should start a blog. He was like, cool. I said, we need a name. He said, how about Very Smart Brothers? I was like, good. <laughs> I went and bought the URL, then boom, um, the rest is history. We were able to, VSB writing, using our voices to tell our stories has taken me places I never thought I'd go. I managed to speak in places where I know I had no business speaking, even though I, I belonged in the room, but I'm not sure the people who brought me there realized who they were bringing in. Um, we've been able to do things, you know, Oprah called me. That's like my claim to fame at this point. Oprah <laughs> read an article I wrote and, and it called me because of that. Like, that's just something you don't see happening when you start a blog randomly. Mm -hmm. But it's something that can happen to you if you dedicate yourself to your voice and amplifying your voice and, and staying true to what you believe in and what you feel like talking about, which could be wings and flats one day and could be slavery the next. I mean, it could, <laughs> sometimes it's spades and sometimes it's, you know, police brutality. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, Very Smart Brothers is, is our baby. It is something that we believe in heavily, and it's something that we've tried to use responsibly to be an addition to the black community, because that's kind of what I feel like my role is in the community. It's to, you know, even if I don't put anything on the table, I gotta make sure I'm not taking anything off of it, but thankfully I've been able to put a lot on the table. Excellent, thank you. So let me ask this of, of all of you, and whoever wants to start can jump in, and then we'll go to the audience, and I'm also, uh, mindful of time, but you know, all of you have these different experiences, right? But one of the things that I think really comes through is the importance of expressing your voice, first of all, but then also leveraging a variety of new platforms that are available to us these days. So when you think about, on one hand, why is it so important, especially in this moment, 
for black people, young black people, to make their voices be heard. But also, how do you see us using the internet technology to catapult that voice? Um, I'll answer that first, seeing I'm very passionate about. For me, um, as a filmmaker, um, it's important that, to me, that we tell our stories. You know, because we have so many of them. And oftentimes, our stories aren't done justice. You know, uh, people see it, they, they, they typecast what they think the black experience is without really experiencing it. We're, they, we're so layered, you know, from top to bottom that it's important that we tell our stories. You know, we can't let other people tell our stories and dictate our narrative. We have to always be in control of what's going on. And the beauty about social media is that now, if you do it right, you don't necessarily need approval to have a platform. You know, there are people who I know who have YouTube channels and they have like two million followers. Mm -hmm. You know, there are people who I know that that um, that they just have like blogs. You know, and they have like half a million followers. That brings revenue. You know, I know people on, on Instagram who have like a hundred thousand followers, and I and I know legitimate working actors who don't have that many followers. Mm -hmm. Like they're on network TV every single week and they mm -hmm. don't have 100 plus thousand followers. But I know someone who's smart, who knows how to market themselves, who knows how to um, use what, what they have, Google University, you know, <laughs> um, you know, and they really push the agenda and they know how to engage with their audience. And that's mm -hmm. the most important part because of course, obviously we all, for in, in my line of work, we all want the studios and the networks to back our work. I mean, that's just what it is. You want the studios to fund your film, you want the networks to pick up your pilot. It's just what it is. And every, for every filmmaker, writer in here, I'm sure you can echo similar sentiment. But I'm saying to you, in this day and age, that's not the end or be all. Mm -hmm. You know, you can definitely go out there and have an amazing web series, posting it on YouTube, posting it on various different platforms, mm -hmm. Vimeo. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Where you could release your own episodes every single week. You know, I mean, I've seen Issa Rae is probably the best example at this mm -hmm. with, with Awkward Black Girl. And um, she took that and made it, I mean, she's huge now. I mm -hmm. mean, she commands what she wants. HBO literally gives her whatever she wants. <laughs> literally. You know, I'm not lying. It's, it, and, and that's a perfect example of what you can do without having to wait for someone to say yes to you. Mm -hmm. Taking your opportunity, taking your talent, taking our stories, and making something of it. And that's how I feel like this, the internet, um, Instagram, social media has really changed things than was 20 years ago, you know? Um, because I feel like visi visibility is important, and that allows for that. Thank you. Christina Panama? Yeah. So, um, two things. 100% for me, technology. Uh, if it wasn't for uh, PCs and being able to build my own PCs, and having an understanding of the internet when it wasn't as big as it is before Facebook, I definitely wouldn't be doing what I'm doing. Um, it was my first Mac that, that turned me on. It was the first DSLR that was like, oh, wow, I can get shots that you, you normally couldn't get because the cameras were too big. I think for me, the reason that I tell stories is, is, is for me a bit larger. I, I started a high school uh, two years ago. We were a summer program for five years. And so I have these ninth and 10th graders now, and all they know is what they see online and what they see on the television. They don't have a concept of even slavery. They don't even have a concept of the fact that they're black in some cases um, or Hispanic. Their concept of life is in a very small bubble of what they consume. Um, and for example, when um, the fact that I can say his name now, I think I can take uh, XX Tatashian died. It was so heartbreaking to see how someone who they never met, kind of like when we experienced the Leo or Michael Jackson dying, mm -hmm. um, had impacted their lives. Uh, when, when They See Us came out and we watched it in class, how that impacted their understanding of not being even able to experience that in asking why, 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 not knowing that happens every day in their neighborhood because we live in one of the highest, um, the lowest economic neighborhoods in Philadelphia. And so seeing things like that and then reading I Know Why the Cage Bird Sings, never being exposed to Maya Angelou. One of the kids said, who was a Maya Angelou? Um, and so seeing that and then knowing that they are all, well, 80% of my students are experience, have experienced some form of sexual assault and then they can't even get past chapter number 10 because of the rape. 
Um, so for me, telling stories helps them to have a have a have an escape, have a way out, but also educates them at the same time. Mm -hmm. And if we don't tell stories, the only stories that they will know is the songs that the rappers sing. Mm -hmm. um, and the Instagram, the inst and the Instagrammers who are really out for revenue, um, who all that they see is Brazilian butts. And so mm -hmm. if we don't tell quality stories and using our technologies to do that, um, our generation of uh, blackness and um, people of color is gonna be lost. Thank you. Yeah, as a content creator, the one thing that the internet has, you know, made possible is for us to fill in all the gaps that mainstream outlets, media leaves, and everything they do. Like I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a writer, I'm a music writer by trade, more or less. And uh, one of the things I hate is when I read music reviews mm. in places mm. like Pitchfork mm. or the Washington Post, the No Shots, No Shots Fired, <laughs> or the New York Times, or any of these places where you have people who have no idea what they're talking about writing about our music, mm -hmm. right? You'll see an album that matters to everybody in this room, mm -hmm. for the most part, get 200 words in a B minus. And that affects their money, that affects their revenue. Meanwhile, I'll take a look at, I'll give you a perfect example. I just did this. Jadena just released an album called 85 to Africa. So good. So I, I love this album. I read several reviews in several places. It got like 400 words in each one of those places. I was like, there's no way in hell I'm gonna let this ride. This album matters to me, this album is good, this album is our music, it's got Caribbean influences, West African influences, it's all over the place. Mm -hmm. I wrote like 2,500 words about this. I wrote his whole life story down. I wrote everything, and I had to cut it down to like 1,500 because y'all ain't going to read 2,500 words on the internet about Jadena. I mean, I just I hate to tell you that, but it's just a fact. But I, I got 1,500 words in there that I thought all mattered because I thought it was important to tell his story, right? That's what the internet makes. It makes it possible for us to tell our stories in the way they need to be told not just, not just putting them out there to exist, but it gives a lot of us jobs, it gives a lot of us the ability to speak in ways that allow the rest of us to be seen, allows other communities to see us in ways that they didn't want to acknowledge, quite frankly. Mm -hmm. I mean, the brilliance in Ava DuVernay's uh, um, film, hmm. When They See Us, was that the name is a double entendre. Mm -hmm. When they see us, you know, maybe they'll look at us differently, but when they see us, you know what I mean, like they, when they find, when, when, when you all see us, mm -hmm. when America sees us, mm -hmm. maybe they'll see some humanity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And when they see us in this way, then maybe they'll see how, how the police have treated us. Like it's, it's, but if we don't tell those stories, who's gonna do it? Mm -hmm. Like if we don't do it, I can't expect anybody else to tell my story, they don't care. Mm -hmm. It's everybody in this room, we, I mean, we care about our stories, but you know, that's, that's what the internet does. And that's why I love the fact that everybody's on YouTube. Everybody's even the even the ridiculous folks. Like I don't know how y'all feel about Cardi B. I mean, she's ridiculous, but she's I love her. Ridiculous. Like I love people <laughs> that just out there living there. But like she's being authentically her yeah. and making money doing it. Listen, we need that's that's part of our story too. I hate respectability politics. I'm gonna go ahead and say that. So any of your cousins out here acting a plum fool on Instagram, they are my cousins too. <laughs> so send them my way. I will happily amplify them. Oh, um, <laughs> so real quick, want to see who in the audience might have a question. Anybody? One, you get to ask your question. We're coming with the mic. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, I'm Taylor Ware, Congressional Black Caucus Fellow. Um, I want to know what you all feel that the role of creatives is in the 2020 election, um, and also just in the overall pull for young black voters. So uh, I think one of the things that you we always have to think about is that a creator um, was one of the main reasons that Obama got into office, mm -hmm. right? Um, there was a creator who wasn't even black who said, let me make a poster about him and then plastered it everywhere, right? Mm -hmm. uh, there, were, there was a creator who wasn't black once again, Mark Zuckerberg, who said, hey, let's figure out how we can use the internet for these things. If, if creators don't amplify the voice of the, needing, the need to vote, then people won't vote, right? Think about uh, Diddy, right, and Rock the Vote. 
that was a creator amplifying the voice through influence. And so I think one of the big problems is that creators can be, at times, we're very reactive instead of proactive. And also, just in general, politicians don't necessarily know how to use creatives because we don't work inside of the system. So for example, I was listening to Congressman, um, Congresswoman uh, Yvette, and I'm like, wow, if people can actually hear her talk. And then I look at her Instagram, and I was like, yeah, it's not a lot of her talking. Right? For us, we're very visual. Mm -hmm. And in the ability to communicate the stories, then we'll see, oh wow, that's why we need to actually create in order to amplify the voice of the 2020 elections. But then now we have to figure out how to weed out all the voices because there's so many. And it's the propaganda that has allowed the, the previous election to go on, and propaganda is media. Mm -hmm. right? When you think about Adolf Hitler, media. Right? When you think about um, slavery, media. It's the, the message that we're, we're communicating. So a big part of the problem is that creators have to look at it and say, I want to create a message, regardless of how much money it pays me, in order to, to, to walk alongside everyone else to amplify the message, for me anyway. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, art, all the art that we're doing, a lot of it is, is political. When I, when I decide to write an article about chicken and Popeyes, I mean, it's funny, <laughs> but, but it's, it's political, political. Because yeah. at the end of the day, I'm writing about, like, in a funny way, like our love for chicken, but and I'm not allowing it to be weaponized, right? I'm not allowing somebody to to throw chicken in my face and say, "Oh, that's just some fried chicken." Some who don't eat chicken, mm -hmm. like why? <laughs> like that's that's chicken, the kind of stuff that that that's part of the reason why creators need to be doing this stuff because how do people get to weaponize watermelon and chicken? You know what I'm saying? Like well, like the fact that that exists, creators and content creators and artists of all sorts, musicians, artists. Like what Kahende Wiley and Amy Shiro did, that is, that is political art. Mm -hmm. And it's sitting up in the portrait gallery forever, and that is political art. So the ability to be a creator, as long as people take that responsibility and everybody is, everybody's not required to do it. I'm not one of the mm -hmm. folks that believes that everybody, I don't need Young Thug to go out here and try to convince anybody <laughs> to, to go vote for Bernie Sanders or whoever. Yeah, like I don't, I don't need it. <laughs> in fact, I kind of need him to go work for the other side if, he's, <laughs> if we're going to try to do some damage. But uh, shots fired. But... Um, <laughs> You know, I think as long as, as long as politicians and individuals in positions of power and authority don't view those of us in the creative community in a negative way and allow us to be part of the conversation and allow us to have, allow us to help whatever messaging goes. I mean, let's be real. Artists get messages a lot further than, 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 than most people. We live in D.C. We live in a hell of a bubble around here. Like, people think that what happens in D.C., that people in in Toledo care that much. And t maybe they do locally, but some of the conversations we're having, like how does that affect if I can eat tonight? Mm -hmm. But artists, musicians are able to travel in places that, that ev everybody else's voice can't. Mm -hmm. So, you know, as long as, though, as long as we're allowed to be part of the conversation, part allowed to be part of the process, I think a lot of wonder can be done. I now see a campaign for mumble rappers for Trump happening next year. <laughs> so it's just like, that's I'm not taking about. shots at mumble rappers. That was about Young Thug, personally. <laughs> I was going to say, he might okay. win if we did that. <laughs> so I want to see if there's um, maybe one more question from the audience, because we have an entire segment after this. So if not, we'll start doing wrap-up, one burning deep desire, and... I was okay, say, one of the artists one. is going to ask one. this question. Okay. Can you Howard in the house, yeah. H-U. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I'll do it for y'all. So this question is kind of twofold. Mm -hmm. um, how do you go about kind of getting support as well as maintaining your writing? Something that we've mm -hmm. noticed is, you know, you start, you get that project started, and then you hit mm -hmm. writer's block, and you might get it done, and then you submit to a festival, and it's great, and it's like, mm -mm. what next? Mm -hmm. It's a lot of what next, it's a lot of how do you get that money, how do you get that support, mm -hmm. how do you keep going when your story is being told over and over mm -hmm. and people don't, aren't always ready for your story. Is your story being told over and over? That's the first question I would ask. Right? Mm -hmm. So I've been able to do what I've done, um, which is probably about 10 hours of narrative content and the only money I raised was $3,000. Right? Mm -hmm. Now granted, I own a production company so we don't have to pay anything. But one of the things that I've done is figure out, you guys are at Howard, right? You in the film department? Guess what, you have all the equipment that you need, right? You got professors who can critique your films. Stop being so, I would say most people are very, when critique comes, most people are very critical even of the critique. I take all critique, whether you like it or you hate it. I wanna know why do you hate it? Why don't you like it? Writer's block doesn't exist. What happens is we stop writing. 
right? And so what I do is I have a specific day, which works for me, right, that I write every week. Or if I have a project, I do that every week. And I'm always, so I'm the type of person, if the idea sticks, that's the one I need to be working on. If the idea doesn't stick, then I move on to the next thing. So right now, I just finished the project. I just hit my writing partner like, okay, we gotta work on the next project. Um, and so for, for artists, we, we, we should almost never stop because as soon as you get the door open, they're gonna ask you for three projects, right? So you almost need three projects at all time. I would say the people that you work with shouldn't be the people that just do what you say, right? But should be the people that you like working with. Work with the people that are next to you and don't try to go up. Film festivals may say yes, they may say no, but they don't affirm who you are and what your creativity is, and that's something I had to learn. Because my first season, I didn't get in it. I got into like one thing. My second season, I got into what I wanted to get in, and I was like, oh wow, that was nothing, mm -hmm. right? My third season, I didn't even put it in hardly anything, right? Because I was like, I don't need their validation. I'm doing 40,000 minutes per, per week on Amazon, right? And so if your desire is, is the affirmation of the, of the supply chain, you're always going to look for their affirmation, right? Mm -hmm. But if your desire is I'm born to create and I need to create, then you have to let that 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 fire inside of you move you forward. Um, if I was, oh my gosh, if I was in college when I decided, when I realized I was, like people thought, they were like, why aren't you doing, you know, arts and film and communications? I was like, no, I'm going to be an entertainment lawyer. So you know what you want to do? And you have so much more information and so many more resources than any of us. Colleges for creating, Look up Ryan Coogler, right? Mm -hmm. He used college to develop all of his plans to the point where by the time he did his first feature, the next step was making his next feature. He's only three features in, y'all. <laughs> it's not a long career, right? Mm -hmm. But that's because he used his college years to break down that, that concept of writer's block. I never have writer's block. What I generally have is I don't understand my character. I need to work on character development and story development more. So Christina and Reggie, what I want y'all to do really quick, and Reggie, you can pull this into your response. Um, tell people how they can find you, right? And then what's next for you? And we have like one minute, mm -hmm. one minute to make this happen. <laughs> oh, well, I'm on Instagram, on, I'm on everything. So it's just my name, it's just Reggie Lochard, and I'm pretty easy to find. And what's next for me, I'm actually getting ready to work on my next film. We start production at the end of next month. Um, it's called A for Alpha. Uh, it's a project about gender norms and toxic masculinity in today's society. Uh, it, it'll be starring uh, Kendrick Sampson from HBO and uh, Lex Scott Davis. Um, uh, and that's what I'm working on next. But to answer your question, um, as creatives, I'm gonna make this really quick. Everyone is different, you know what I mean? And um, what I personally do is I bullet point everything. Mm. I bullet point every single thing. I, I outline every single thing. You're at Howard University. Use them, milk them to what it's mm -hmm. worth. You're Understand what I'm saying <laughs> about this. Um, my director on my current project, she went to Howard, but then she went to USC. Howard does have a film program, and I do know your director, so I'm surprised that you're even having issues. Um, but with that being said, outline everything. You know, don't just be so quick to, 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 to write and submit. Writing is a process. You have to revise it. You have to edit. You have to make several edits. I mean, this script that I'm, about, this film that I'm about to work on, I've been writing the script for about a year. You know, so it's, it wasn't the first time that it was done. I mean, many people in here know me. I've asked John to read several of my works <laughs> repeatedly, like the same script. Like, read this again. Read this again. You know what I mean? Because it's like, just because you, you're, you're done, being done is a gratifying, it's, it's an amazing feeling but that doesn't always mean that it's ready. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So, so my best advice is once you're done with the script, what ne what's next, what's next, put it down. Walk away from it, let it sink into your body, go back to it and read it. And if you love what, you, what you're reading, then you can say it's, it's ready. But nine times out of 10, after the first draft, it probably won't be ready. And that's just me being honest. Um, so with you. that being said, when you do have writer's block, think about, your characters. Your characters will always drive your story. If you know your protagonist and your antagonist, then you'll know what he or she will and will not do. That will help you drive your story forward. I Thank hope that you. answers your question. Thank you. And Christina, where can people find you? You can find me on the intranets uh, at Christina <laughs> Faith. Uh, Christina Faith on Instagram, Twitter. Um, what's next for me is uh, 
a movie called Love You Right. It's an R&B musical. Um, it's a, see, see, you see how you said yes? That's the same <laughs> way I did it, because black people love music. Um, it is an R&B musical, it's an R&B type of love. It's about Will Clay, who is an R&B singer, who comes against a block when he discovers that everything around him is fake, and he is too. Um, and so we are working on that. We are in the final stages of editing, and Perfect. on Monday we'll submit the Sundance and then send it around. Perfect. Y'all, please join me in thanking our panelists, and thank you, Congresswoman Clark, for creating this thank space. You for having us. We will now thank transition you. to our next session. We have a wonderful film plan for you all um, to allow you to preview it. Is John Gibson in the room? Oh, right there. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. All righty. So I would love to introduce Mr. Gibson. John Gibson is heralded Vice President of External and Multicultural Affairs at Motion Pictures Association of America. That's MPAA. In 2012, he created the Inclusion and Multicultural Outreach Program under the, under the direction of then CEO and former U.S. Senator Chris Dodd. Groundbreaking history has made through the creation of the diversity program, which had not existed in 75 years prior to Gibson and Senator Dodd. They've partnered with minority organizations that champion for diversity in the entertainment world. Gibson has become the organization's voice as he seeks to build long-lasting connections with studios on their behalf. Can everyone join me in giving a warm welcome to Mr. John Gibson. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Oh no, you all can do much better than that. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. So before I introduce the project that we have partnered with the Oprah Winfrey Network on, I just want to, on behalf of the MPA and our member studios, Net Walt Disney, Netflix, Paramount, Sony, Universal, and Warner Brothers, we want to thank the Congresswoman, Congresswoman Yvette D. Clark. She has been a tireless, tireless F, uh, advocate, partner, uh, counselor, as we all move to make the film and TV industry more diverse, diverse, inclusive, and culturally, which this is important, culturally representative of all of the communities. And so I'm so proud of the previous panel because the MPA, we don't work in the creative space at our studios. So in my role, I do it in my very best to support emergent content creators. So Christina and Reggie are MPA ambassadors. And so I was happy to recommend them. And then also, in, I have to recognize in the audience, Congresswoman, we have Calixto Chinchilla is the founder of the New York Latino Film Festival, which is the largest in the country, partnered with HBO, but not just Latinos, but Afro-Latinos, African-American. We know more film and TV were done in Georgia than anywhere. So you have Yvette and Jose of the Georgia Latino Film Festivals, also our partners, among the boards of both film festivals. And then we also have a front row, the, I, I shouldn't I say that, I should say that Donnie Simpson is the Jill Tracy of DC, but she is the voice of South Florida. And so this project means a lot to her. So we have the iconic Jill Tracy. So again, we work with creators at every level, not just our major studios, but for right now, we are going to see the first episode of David Makes Man. And this is by Terrell Alvin McCraney, who will be with us afterwards. We'll do a conversation with him. Terrell won the Oscar because he wrote Moonlight. And this is now his next project in partnership with Michael B. Jordan and Oprah Winfrey. So ladies and gentlemen, let's watch this. This is such a powerful episode of David Makes Man, episode one. Mr. Terrell Alvin McCraney. Okay. Yes. 
So Terrell, one, Jill has had me down in South Florida on her show many a times and meeting the folks of Liberty City and Overtown. I feel like your work, not just with this, but also with Moonlight, it's like it's a love letter to South Florida, the Miami area. And you capture the essence, I think, of young black males, young dark black males, like anybody, because we're seen, but we are not seen. Mm. So kudos to you, and just give us a little background about this love letter. Well, I think, well, first of all, thank y'all for coming. Thank y'all for having me. Thank y'all for coming back, Howard students. Uh, we got some HU students in here, which is, you know, always appreciative. I, th um, I think, you know, one of the things that's really important to me, um, just on a statistical level, um, oh, do I need to stand up? No, no, they can't see me, so I'm gonna move up. Oh, okay. Um, it is that Florida has uh, a legacy of black and African-American, uh, Afro-Caribbean folk um, that is often not talked about. We've got the third uh, largest population of black people in the country. Uh, one of our cities, Miami Gardens, has one of the highest concentration of black people. We have the largest Haitian community outside of Haiti. Um, we have the largest Afro-Latinidad folks in, in America. Mm -hmm. um, and, and no shade to Congress, but even in Congress, that representation's not there. Mm -hmm. The representatives we have from Congress don't look like the constituents of the state. And so it is important that our culture is transmuted through our art forms. Um, it happens in our music. You can hear it in the music that comes out of Florida. But you can't, but you know, there are uh, all the forms of, of culture that we have that come out have to sort of keep that Absolutely. Uh, integral to me. Mm -hmm. um, otherwise, we, you can tell us that we don't exist. Otherwise, you can tell us that, that we don't matter. Otherwise, you can tell us that our pain, when we lose people like Trayvon Martin, uh, isn't founded. Otherwise, you can tell us that our concerns about our brothers and sisters in the Bahamas is, is unfounded. Like, you, you, you know, uh, it's important. If I don't keep reminding us of who we are, who will? Correct. You know, just the other night, and the Congresswoman was there, we honored um, members of Congress, Tony Cardin is uh, this Congressional Hispanic Caucus, and we were talking about you know, we can't just sit by and say, well, that's just affecting that community. Mm. Because when 130 Bahamians were turned away that look like us, mm -hmm. we're all in this together. And when one community succeeds, we all do. But when, when one doesn't, mm -hmm. we're all in this together. Now, you just have this way of, just want to segue just a little bit, of just pulling at the, the heartstrings. I mean, you did it with Moonlight. You did it with my first and only Broadway show was Choir Boy. Mm -hmm. And Mr. Calixo Chinchilla, head of the New York Latino you know, Film Festival, took me. That pulled, again, young black males. And now with this one, you know, um, you are just our generation. That are, you are becoming our greatest storyteller because, oh, again, nice we are seen, but we just aren't seen. Mm. And there are a lot of TV shows and films made about black people, but they don't understand black people. Mm. And you get it, and you do. Can you talk? Well, thank you. That's thank nice you. of you. Can you talk about um, Gloria? <laughs> yeah, Gloria's the mom, y'all. And I know we were all talking and we were commenting, and there's a lot of uh, just that scene, that kitchen scene. Mm -hmm. Tell us about Gloria. Um. Well, and how many? Of you see, how yeah. many of you? This is the first episode of David Makes Man you've seen. It's okay if it has. It's cool, because it won't be the last. Right. right. <laughs> Well, I just want to make sure I don't put any spoilers out there. So I just want to, that's why I'm making sure. Um, the, you know, that's the only scene you actually see Gloria in. Mm -hmm. And I think the reason why it's so compelling is one, it's authenticity. Alana Arenas, who plays Gloria, mm -hmm. uh, is born and raised in the 305. She's um, from Carroll City, Opelika area. Wow. And she, she and I actually grew up together. Which, but I didn't tell that to Miss Oprah when I, when I, when she auditioned. Okay. Because I made her, uh, you know, everybody's got audition for the part. You got to get it, you know. And she and and Alana, like me, is very about integrity. You know, yeah. you want to make sure she got it on her own. So she sent in the tape, and I showed it to Miss Winfrey. Never saying that I knew her. Never saying we grew up together. We went to high school and undergrad together. Never saying one thing. And after she watched it, Miss Winfrey said, "She's gonna be Gloria, right?" And I said, I, yeah. she was like, no, no, <laughs> she's going to be Gloria, correct? Um, and it was actually that scene that she, that she did. 
And I think it's just, again, uh, Alana has all, Alana, like myself, has a deep love for the people in Miami. Yes. Um, has a love for the, 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 the single mothers that we grew up around. Um, has a love for their struggle. Mm -hmm. Has a love for the joy. I mean, you get to see, in this scene, it was not as, uh, a, a, not as explicit, but you get to see Gloria through this season um, trying the best she can to keep joy in her boy's yeah. life. And um, nothing's more heartbreaking for me than looking back on all the times that my mom tried to uh, keep joy in my life when the world kept trying to keep it out. Um, and, and how I, my, and she deserved a medal for it, and I just was ungrateful. Um, and so I have to get it right. You know, I have to put it back in, into perspective and, and, and keep the honor of those mothers who are still trying to keep joy yeah. in their boys' lives. What I love what you just said about, you know, again, this was your friend, someone you went to school with, someone you grew up with. And oftentimes when, you know, we talk about the industry and Hollywood looking at areas where ordinarily they wouldn't go to look at talent, mm. it's sometimes you have to prop up that one bright star to get to the point that you've got and then you reach back oh, for to sure. pull people with you. So when people are like, oh, no, I want Hollywood to come here, it's like, you can do that. Or mm -hmm. we can take a chance and put ourselves back in Florida. And one of the things that was important to me is, again, connecting to that legacy of black Floridians. I mean, Zora Neale Hurston was from... Florida, uh, literally 10 miles away from where we were shooting. And sometimes we were shooting in places. Um, there was a school called Her uh, uh, in Houston, Texas, in Texas, Florida, that we wanted to, we wanted to shoot at um, because, I, because I wanted to be that close mm -hmm. to her legacy and the and legacy of um, one of the greatest literary minds um, and black minds, but minds in general in, in America. And it it's always important to remember that. So when we get there, that means that all of the little girls who can audition for roles in the show, yes. mm -hmm. right, mm -hmm. are little black girls <laughs> from where Zora Neale Hurston grew up, right? All of the little boys that can come and do and be in J, all those boys running around with JG yeah. can be, it starts to bring the community in. So it's not even just reaching back for people that I know, mm -hmm. it's reaching back for people I don't. Right. All the PAs that want to start get they're right from an area that isn't already always affected by um, production. It's folks that never get a chance to do it and want to do it and are longing to do it. Um, now they have an opportunity. We were in a school, um, Dr. Phillips, which is where Amanda Seals went to high school, uh, and um, and that meant the dance the dancers in that um, school got a chance to come be a part of our production sure. and meet Miss Oprah, Oprah Winfrey. How you know if we didn't do that there, that would have never happened. But the places that often get that that experience, yep. New York, Georgia, Atlanta, mm -hmm. and, uh, and, uh, and, and and Hollywood, mm -hmm. you know, those experiences are, are brushed off. Let's talk about the uh, when David missing the bus. Yeah. <laughs> the conversation with Sky. Because mm. Sky just, you know, the, the, towards the end, when I first saw it, I wasn't prepared for it. Right. Sometimes your mind just doesn't like, like we were saying, is he or isn't he? Right. But, you know, Sky is that, you know, Obi-Wan Kenobi sure, for him. Sure, And, you know, David misses, but when he code switches, if you will, mm -hmm. you know, we've been doing that all our lives. You just go into character. Yeah. Like, what was your thought, like, that writing that whole of him, even though he's going to the school, he's seen people that not necessarily look like him, mm -hmm. but are, you know, he's not the only black, but he still had to go into character, mm -hmm. if you will. Mm -hmm. Is that... Um, what was your thought behind specifically trying Because we don't always see that where we have to go into character. Well, I wish, you know, this, this is one of those moments where I admit, I admit not, you know, I, I always, I think people give me a lot more credit than they, than they should. I, it wasn't important. It's not one of those moments where I go, this is be interesting and this will really get them. Mm -hmm. They'll love this. It really was a moment of like, oh no, this is what I did every morning on the way mm -hmm. to school. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This is what I did. Mm -hmm. So I'm just gonna tell you what I did. Yeah. <laughs> right. And if you resonate with it, if you understand that, if you know what it means to go outside of your neighborhood to go to a school where they're to where they're telling you what I'm giving you mm -hmm. is important, mm -hmm. and what I'm giving you are the tools for life, and then they're telling you what you're learning back at wherever you are from, that's worthless. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. And then mm -hmm. you go into your neighborhood, and your neighborhood, some people are telling you, like, whatever you get from that school is worthless because it's not going to help you survive this. Yeah. So then you have to start trying to decide and who, who am I? Which person is authentically yeah. me? Who is more me? Who cares about yeah. my wholeness? Right? Mm -hmm. Who's just trying to use me to get after what they want? 
right? Um, and, and it's harder to see sometimes with schools because schools will, pret will pretend like, oh, this is altruistic. When in truth, you're a number that's mm -hmm. helping them underprop their program. Yeah. So the better you do, the better the school does, the more money it gets. Absolutely. Right? Mm -hmm. And it's really not that different sometimes from the drug game. <laughs> yeah. Because the better you do, the more mm -hmm. money the drug dealer gets. So like at some point, you start recognizing that nobody's really interested in who you are inside. Mm -hmm. And so it was really important to me to make sure that we saw what David was, you know, David toggling between like, nobody asked David, how are you doing except right. Sky? And Sky is now a part of his imagination. Yeah. And so sometimes we have to build that for ourselves. Yeah. And, and how many young people are building that, that voice for themselves and, and how that's still tiring. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But even like, you, you, you know, again, let's go into the school. A lot of what you do is based on your experiences and others. But again, mm -hmm. we just haven't seen them. So it's like an emotional tug, the, him sitting with the principal. Mm -hmm. And she's upset, you know, you know, she's, I need to talk to him, I need to talk to him. The lights just got back on. Mm -hmm. And then when she connected that dot, well, baby, have you eaten? Mm -hmm. I, that was me. Mm -hmm. It was, and, but you, we, we just hadn't, hadn't seen that. Mm -hmm. Does it, um, when you're writing this stuff and when it plays out, does it take you back and it's, uh, is it emotional or is it, you, or, are you, as an artist, as a, is it therapy? Like for your, you know, for. The, well, the therapy, the, the therapy helps me make sure I write, I, I put it out in the world. Yeah. Um, the, the therapy is in the community conversations that I have with other people. When mm -hmm. people talk to me about it, when we have conversations, that's where the healing lies in. The, the art to me is about, always about sparking the conversation. Yeah. So, you know, the, fi the, 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 the fire is warm, but the healing happens in, around the circle. Yeah. You know what I mean? You make the hearth so people go, ooh, it's warm. Let's sit down and talk about this. And then, so that's the fire. That's the art. But when people start sitting down and have conversation, conversation mm -hmm. the, the dialogue across the flame is actually where the healing happens. Yes. Right? So for me, it's really about making the flame, you know, stoking the flames with the best art that I can. So people will go, let me sit around this for a little bit. Yeah. Right? And then someone goes, ooh. This is good to me. This yeah. is good to me too. Exactly. So you yeah. start. Th you, you, that's the building that's important to me, um, and you know, uh, uh, I that mo those moments about you know, baby, did you eat or mm -hmm. things like that. Those are moments where you know it's again someone like you will come to me and say, you know, that moment happened to me, and mm -hmm. I go tell somebody else. Yes. Not because I want us to relish in those moments that we didn't have, but. So that we will know, yo, this all happened to us. We are grown folks, Absolutely. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? With, with different access and capabilities. So that means that there is some child right now who's yeah. being asked, baby, did you eat today? And the Absolutely. answer is no. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And what are we grown folks Don't are going to it. do about that? That's what's important to it me. Is. That's a great point. Dr. Woods Trap, how did you <laughs> get the iconic Felicia Rashad to play that? And <laughs> I think if I would have gotten anybody else, she would have punched me in the face. <laughs> <laughs> you know, whenever we ever see, I think <laughs> she just lights up. You, you, you feel safe whenever mm. I see her in something. Mm. So you have her plan and a, a, a incredibly nurturing, mm -hmm. you can tell by how she dealt with the boys, mm -hmm. nurturing teacher. How important is it for us, schools that have educators like that? Oh my God. I mean, one of the things that uh, Ms. Felicia talks about all the time, which I think is important, is the difference between uh, generations after her, after segregation, and mm -hmm. how they learned, because when, whenever I, when I first talked to her about the process, I was like, you know, I just want to talk about the fact that you know I had a lot of teachers. I rarely, maybe one of them would be black, mm -hmm. and they would take a special interest in me. And that, and she was like, one of your, you know, in that way, she did. One of your teachers was black. One, mm -hmm. huh? And I was like, well, what, 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 what did I do? Yeah. And she was like, every single one of my teachers up until how was black. Every, be, and they were people that were in her community and of her community. So they knew your mom, they, they went to school. They were, it was a community school. And, it was, and she was in a gifted and accelerated program, right. Right? right? Now, when I talk to people my age, if we went to a gifted and accelerated or talented program, yeah. it was out of our community. Absolutely, yeah. our teachers were rarely black. We and we would some, you know, sometimes have, but rarely. And then, and then, like again, all of the kind of uh, diversity numbers were happening. So you were two of the two of the yeah. of the ten people of color, right, in a class of twenty. 
and that would be, and you would have to kind of negotiate in a different way. And she was like, that's why this is important because you all aren't, along with the nurturing and the education, and the numbers and the reading and scholarship that, that, that they were getting, they were also getting community education. Yeah. They were learning to love their community and not you know, take their talents outside. We were taught that all of your talent, in order for it to grow, mm -hmm. needed to happen outside. outside. Yeah. Even if they didn't tell us that directly, they definitely showed us Absolutely. indirectly. Yeah. David takes a 40 minute ride to school every day. I know because I took that bus. <laughs> and so if I had to take a 30 to 40 minute ride to school in middle school outside and that's where my talent could grow, yeah. that's I'm, my, my self-esteem is saying, here I cannot prosper. Right. But I, I can go out here and do a whole lot. Mm -hmm. And that, and in turn, our athletes are taught that, our, our, our artists are taught that, mm -hmm. our intellects are taught that. So they take all of that talent and just drain it right out of the community. Yeah. And so it's important that we stop, we, we look at that we look at that pipeline because it, it, the drain and the, the strain that it puts on the, on the community is, is more intense than we're actually reckoning with. It is. I know we're running out of time, so I'm going to no, stop no, no, no. talking so much. So, talking um, too much. I know we, just a couple more questions. No, Sorry, and I, <laughs> We're going to open it up for discussion, too. Yeah, so yes. how, did, how did you bring the product? Like, you got Oprah Winfrey, mm -hmm. Michael B. Jordan. How mm -hmm. did it get to that what started? How did yeah? Um, Andre Holland. Do you know guys know who Andre Holland is? Andre Holland uh, played Kevin in Moonlight, mm -hmm. but he also is in everything. Yes, <laughs> like Andre, he's been on a season of American Horror Story. Yes. Like, um, he's one of my best friends, one of my closest friends. And uh, about five or six years ago, he um, um, just said, "I want you to, I want you to just have a week." I didn't really have any money at that time. Still don't have a lot of money, but I definitely didn't have any money that time. And he, um, and he was like, I'm just gonna put you up in LA for a week, and I just want you to write stuff. I just want you to write. Because that's how Andre is. Andre's that person. He's like, I, you are talented. You don't have to write anything for me. Just do it. Um, and one of the things I was sitting there, do, I, I was sort of trying to get my brain around, like, why is he doing this, one? But then two, like, what's, it, what's important to me, and why am I not? I'm doing fine in my career. You know, I'm working, but why am I second guessing myself all the time? Mm -hmm. um, and it started to dawn on me that every time I walked into a room, especially full of white people, I would go into this anxiety of figuring out, figuring out what they wanted. <laughs> what do they want? How do I give it to them as soon as possible so they leave me alone? Right? And do it in a way that I'm also going to not undermine myself, but also advance my career. Like the game of like, yeah. and, I, and then I realized that it was a double dutch that I was playing. I was literally going, what's the rhythm? Mm -hmm. What's the rhythm? Mm -hmm. And the level of anxiety of that was happening to me on way too many, in way too many occasions. I stepped on the bus, I was feeling like that. I stepped any room I was walking into, just what's the rhythm? What's the rhythm? And I didn't understand where that came from. And so I, I said, oh, I remember the first day I felt it is getting off the bus at my magnet school and walking into that room with yeah. all these CEOs, kids, and mm -hmm. going, I don't know what I'm doing here. I'm official. I, I don't belong here. And I better pretend like I do fast. Yeah. Um, and so I, I remember I said to, I, I wrote down this, I, at that time I called it Gifted, but then another show came up with that title, so I had to leave it alone. But I called it Gifted. I just started writing about that, that moiety, that difference, that... And I brought it to, MB, to Michael B. Jordan, and I said, look, this is what I want to uh, write about, this kid who like, you know, feels, starts changing as he moves environments. Mm -hmm. and, and MBJ said, that's me, I did that. Mm -hmm. And I brought it to Mike Kelly and Melissa Loy, who are writers, and they were like, that's fascinating, I never heard about that. I brought it to Dee Harris Lawrence, who is our showrunner, mm -hmm. and she was like, oh, I did that, I'm David. I'm a female David. I was in South Central. I was in school in I was in school in uh, in South LA, and I when I went to school in Beverly Hills, that was me. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, and then I talk, I brought it to Miss Winfrey, and she was like, "Oh no, I know I know that. I feel that. I've seen that. And my the students that I have in South Africa are yeah. dealing with the same thing when they go to school in Ivy Leagues. Yeah. So it was one of those moments where people started to really match Flint to Flint. Yeah. They start going, "Yo, this is my story. This is my mm -hmm. story. Our our story." And I and I said, "Okay, that's." And that to me meant that we had, I had to tell it because now it's not just me. Yep. It's not my experience. It's not just a feature. 
it's a series, right? It's a series of, of events and, and, and conversations around this very thing. Well, we are grateful for you for telling our story. No, thank you. Thanks are there for a couple me to of tell. questions out here? Oh, dope. Um, oh, dope. And um, you do tell stories. Like, you just said it's not only for children, it's for kids. The micro. This, this is historic. All right. This story is not only about just coming of age. I think it's for all of us who deal with assimilation. Sure. And this mythical next level mm -hmm. that they always tell you you have to go to, <laughs> that you have to go, leave from where you are comfortable mm -hmm. to be uncomfortable mm. to prove that to prove who you are and I love the fact that you tell this story in a way that we can get it at all levels mm -hmm. thank you thank, thank you, you so much I mean I think one of the things one of the things I, I, I would love to nuance is that you know the there I agree with you there's a level there's always a sort of next ring to jump through right uh, as, as the uh, the belated Toni Morrison uh, uh, just said or says in my mind all the time. That's exact. That's the fun. That's the fundamental f form and function of racism, is that it's constantly asking us to prove ourselves human. Mm -hmm. Where's your culture? Prove I got culture. Where's yeah. your music? Mm -hmm. Prove I got music. Where's your learned letters? Like, prove we got letters and poetry. Like prove it, prove it. And we spend so much time proving, exhausting ourselves, that we have nothing left to give to our children, to ourselves, to our community. So that, um, and a pla but a place of discomfort doesn't bother me. It's the place of suffering. And I say that because I watch specifically black women in corporate environments or in envir even in, 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 in high, quote unquote, high level environments being uh, conditioned and socialized to be quiet, to small in themselves, to lessen themselves, to not be that stereotypical uh, angry black woman, and like go home with all of that. And that isn't just uncomfortable, that's suffering. Because they're being asked to, their job, most jobs, all, if, if, if anybody, if, 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 if you ask anybody what they want to do in their career, is that they want to bring their whole self to it. So here is a person who's being asked to bring their whole self, but only this much, every day. So imagine a table, and imagine someone says, here, you have room at the table, but when you get to the table, there's legs right in front of your part. So when right. you move over to go to this side, there's mm -hmm. something blocking you on that side. <laughs> so now you're sitting at the table trying to talk like this. That's not discomfort, that's suffering. Yeah. And we can handle levels of discomfort. Discomfort helps us all grow. That's how we figure things out. Discomfort means there's a leg here, I can move around it. That's, dis that's discomfort. Suffering is when you're making me do all of these things to be a part of, but really not asking for all of me to be here. And I think, I think that's the level, what, you are, what you're articulating is some of the things that we go through as adults. And that's why when folks ask me about why a 14-year-old, I'm saying, yeah, why a 14-year-old? Because if I'm making you look at a 14-year-old and he's enduring that now, yeah. Yeah. my Lord, what are you doing today? How much of those things did you carry over today? How much of it am I doing on the stage of the, uh, of the Academy Awards it, thinking I shouldn't be here, what should I do, what, in, what do yeah. I have to jump through next? Mm -hmm. If that's going through my mind up there, it started somewhere. And the only way to undo that is to figure out where I started practicing it. Mm -hmm. Yes, you dropping some nuggets. <laughs> One of the things that I really love about this show is the inclusion and like the real complexity of LGBT identities that are yeah. black mm -hmm. and like really, really black for real black. Uh -huh. So <laughs> this is something that is really historic and groundbreaking because we know that there have always been black LGBT people, like for real, at the house, at the church, around the corner, everything. But we're finally getting to see some of them now on television, like with, in it, as like main characters, not just folks who come on, like the cousin who comes on during sweeps in right. November. But um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, for comedic relief. Right, yeah. I mean, cause that's been like the tradition. But why do you think, why now? Why, uh, why is Hollywood responding to these narratives and especially in a really complex and hu in a, com a complex way with a lot of humanity right now? I can't speak for Hollywood. 
I, I will speak to one of the reasons why we went to the OWN Network, which was because folks like uh, the great Ava DuVernay and uh, uh, Will Packer and um, you know, Tyler Perry were telling black stories um, in nuanced ways. And the, when, we get, when we see you know, shows like Queen Sugar and Greenleaf and when they see us, and um, when we see things like that, and you, and you say to yourself, oh, I want to add to that conversation, mm -hmm. that's where we will have success. Because when we get, again, when we gather around the fire to hear stories about ourselves, the more versions of that story, you, you, uh, I don't know if this happened with y'all, but like in my family, people would compete to tell stories. <laughs> like Uncle, Uncle Archie would start with a story and be like, nah, nah, that ain't how it goes. Right, you would right. hear sis exactly. so-and-so mm -hmm, going in. Mm -hmm. And it's the same way with, a, with a, in dances. Sometimes people would dance and like, you'd be like, oh, that ain't how it does. Let me show you how singing to, right. like when we art form together, we add on to the nuance of it. You know, we love a harmony. We love a harmony. We love to add a harmony in and a rift in in a way, and it makes it feel sweet to us. And so that, that jazz, that, that kind of adding on to the story, to the braid of the story, is really what's happening now. I, I made a conscious decision. We could have, you know, this show was bought in every room we pitched it to. Um, and we pitched a lot of places. Every room made us an offer on this show. We decided to, we wow, intentionally decided to get it right there. And, and though your applause is great, it wasn't for your applause. The reason we went is because we wanted to be where we were already telling black stories to black people. And, that, and I think that's what, why you're seeing a, 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 a more nuanced approach, because now we don't have just one. That's, that's what the, the, you know, the patriarchy likes to tell us. You can only be one. Yeah. And so if you can only be one, then what do you do? Well, I can't tell every part of the story. I only can tell this much of it as fast as I can and get the hell off the, off the block. But if, if you got a place where you can like, oh, no, I got room because, you know, Sister Ava's got that covered with the border loans or, you know, Brother Tyler's got that covered with the, I can tell this part because I'm with, I don't have to worry about being the only. Right. Right? And that was one of the reasons why, you know, this is MPA working with James and the team at home who have been incredible because it really is prestige TV. It mm -hmm. is, um, we saw Don Lynn Gardner mm -hmm. the other day from Queen Sugar. Mm -hmm. And what I told her, this season, it forced certain family members to have tough conversations. Oh, yeah. Like, you cannot it's watch season. Queen Sugar and then you coming right behind <laughs> and not have a dry eye. It's the same thing. The same thing with your direct, you, and when you all get into more episodes, you will see this. The way you get these young men, and you did this with Moonlight, the emotion in the eyes on that network, it tells the, it is so powerful, so effective in the way, Akili, this, where did you, where did he, this young man who plays David, where, like, where? Houston, Texas, baby. They doing something out of Houston. Yeah. They, with Beyonce and Akili. Yeah. <laughs> like, you just, I mean, no, he, I mean, get, I wish I could take credit for the amount of amazing, um, talented actors, especially young actors that I, yes. I work with, but I cannot, Akili, uh, all I can say is, like you said, we cast the net wide. Mm -hmm. um, we didn't sort of just go, oh, let's look into the reservoir of what, you know, the Hollywood functionality of, yeah. of what this could be. We said, you know, send us a tape. And he sent in a tape from Houston. Mm -hmm. And, and we, we watched them. Sometimes it's just that simple. Yeah. Watch the tape. Watch what somebody sends in. You know, watch what the... So we did, and he and he was the a front runner. Now some people were like Terrell; he's a little green. He's never done a show before. Like, mm -hmm. And I said, that's exactly why we need him. Yeah, and um, I know Miss Hopper used the term poetry. But when I got into the second, third, and I was talking to James, it's like it is like these young brothers are they're they're like it's Shakespeare. Oh yeah, you but, just wait. Right, exactly. It gets <laughs> just like wait. further down. It gets you're like oh, the dialogue is just going to blow your mind. And I know we have to wrap up again Wednesdays at 10 p.m. Nine. Open is now? Now nine. Okay, we're so that's why Queen Sugar. Queen Sugar, Sugar has done its finale, and so now we're moving into nine o'clock spot. So I didn't want y'all to miss it. Yes. <laughs> Just nine o'clock uh, uh, Eastern. It's been going. DVR, get caught up. Ladies and gentlemen, the Oscar winning Terrell Alvin McCraney. Please give it up. <laughs> thank you. Oh, thank y'all. That's very kind. Thank y'all so much.